There's nothing more exhilarating than pointing out the shortcomings of others, is there? This video is made possible due to those who support me on Patreon. I'd like to give a shout out to patrons Christopher Spirit B, Conrad Truitt, Dan Ray, Eric Navarro, Flake, Frame by Frame, Joseph Abrams, Kristen Bennett, Kyle Kramer, Majin Wiebe, Mariah, Matthew Gay, Sophia Narwitz, and Stephen Dillon. Thank you all for your support. Good evening, Macabros. So today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. Some of you may remember my second video ever entitled Why the Departed Sucks. And you may have noticed that I unlisted said video. The reason I did so is because in retrospect, I don't think it is emblematic of what the channel stands for today. Now, to be clear, I still stand by my claim that the departed does in fact suck and actually believe I made some strong arguments in that video. But at the time, I was still trying to find my style and in retrospect, I think I was trying too hard to emulate the whole, the whole you know, the whole rage bro aesthetic, uh, which in turn soured the actual good points I think I made. For that reason, its presence on the channel, like, it kind of bugged me for a while, and I was torn as to how to address it. Like, should I just delete it, remake it? Uh, but then I settled on a different idea. So what we're going to do in this video is I'm going to go over my original review and respond to my own arguments, stating which ones I think are somewhat lacking, or, you know, like ones that I I don't really stand by, as well as fleshing out the ones that I do stand by and seeing if I can kind of, you know, deliver them in a more constructive manner. Uh, just a heads up, I'm not going to go into the details of the plot all that much, seeing as I assume most of you are familiar with the film, or will watch my original review for reference, which I will link in the description. Oh, oh, hey, what's also down there in the description? Could it be information on the kick-ass deal being offered by today's sponsor? Well, golly, I think it is. This video is sponsored by Atlas VPN. As a subpar content creator, I have made my fair share of enemies over the years. Red pillars, mint chocolate chip ice cream enthusiasts, members of my Discord will remember the sheer horror of the vegan war of 2021. Thus, I have to ensure I am protected from their insidious malware attacks. That's why I use Atlas VPN, who are currently offering you a huge discount, a whopping three-year subscription for just $1.99 a month, with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Not only does Atlas VPN offer protection from annoying ads and malicious viruses for an unlimited number of devices. Currently, they are holding the fort down for my desktop, iPhone, and my custom-made Family Matters themed iPad, but Atlas VPN allows you to do so while delighting in absurdly fast internet speeds, so you can stream your favorite workout vids and get killer deals on online shopping, even discounts on flights and hotels just in case you have to lay low for a little bit. Once again, Atlas is offering an insane three-year subscription for only $1.99 a month, with a 30 day money back guarantee. So make sure you don't miss out. And now, on to the video. So I start off with a pretty long winded opening about, you know, just like the background of the film and, um, you know, just just what it's about. I, I feel like I've gotten more concise as time has gone on uh, when it comes to my openings, but who knows? I'd, I Like, hopefully. Also, apologies in advance for the audio. I recorded this shit with a blue Yeti under my comforter. Anyways, my first critique is how the film opens with footage of the Boston busing crisis of the 1970s. Now, the stock footage you see at the beginning of the film is that of the Boston busing crisis of the mid-1970s. What does this have to do with the plot or overarching themes of the film? Nothing. And, I'm, I mean, I guess I still agree it doesn't have much to do with the themes of the film. Like, maybe it's meant to draw parallels to how badly the Irish were treated when they first arrived in America, as Costello's monologue discusses, but then why not just show footage of said bad treatment of the Irish? Then again, maybe it's just meant to establish the 1970s time period. I'd say this is definitely an example of me, it, like, this was just me trying to find shit to be pissed off at, as opposed to it actually being something that bothered me. Then I go on to talk about how during the training montage that introduces the adult Colin and Billy, it's edited in such a way that makes it seem like they are in training at the same time, when Colin's training and Billy's training actually take place four years apart per the script. The editing makes it seem like Colin and Billy are in training at the same time, while in actuality these two storylines take place four fucking years apart. In the script, Colin goes through his training and graduates, becoming a state trooper. Then it skips ahead four years to Billy's training. This is why we see Colin being promoted to a higher up position in SIU before Billy even finishes his training. I still stand by this critique since I consider it a very bad instance of editing. So for example, in the film we see clips of Colin training and then it cuts 
to Billy's training, which again, like, you know, per the script, it's it, four years in the future. And then it cuts back four years to Colin's graduation and then jumps ahead again four years. Uh, and that's when, like, Billy's kicked out of the Stadies and Colin gets uh, promoted to um, SIU. Like, it, like, the way it's edited makes it seem like Colin reaches his position in, like, a matter of weeks or months as opposed to years, which is how long it would realistically take. Now, some may say this isn't that big of a deal since the film is just setting up the chess pieces, if you will. And while I do think this particular example is worthy of criticism, but isn't super egregious, I argue it is a symptom of a larger problem of the film, which is that it does a very poor job of communicating the passage of time, especially in terms of how long Billy has been undercover. It's really odd because in previous Scorsese films, particularly Goodfellas and Casino, I think he does a really good job of clearly communicating the passage of time, like we're like we're talking like years or even decades in some cases, while still keeping a consistent pace. While I do believe that Apart's breakneck pace is effective, I also think that it doesn't allow for us to absorb just how long these two men have been living double lives, particularly Billy. While the text of the film implies Billy is undercover for a total of roughly a year and a half or maybe like around two years, this isn't communicated visually at all. Had it not been for this one piece of dialogue, it's been a year of this. I've had enough of this shit. I would have thought Billy was undercover for like maybe a few months at most, which in turn makes his entire character arc in regard to him struggling with losing his identity sort of null. In Infernal Affairs, the Hong Kong film that Apart is based on, Billy's counterpart, Chan, has been undercover for a full decade by the time the plot kicks off. So we really get a sense of how much his undercover work has impacted his sense of identity and the life he used to have before going undercover. Not so much with Billy. I'd say a perfect example of the film doing a really bad job of communicating said passage of time is demonstrated in the very next argument I make in my original review. Queenan mentions that they need Billy to do enough prison time to convince everyone that this isn't a setup. Then Billy goes to prison, which is portrayed in like four shots. Like, no, literally four shots. He's put in a holding cell, he works out in his cell, he is led out of his cell, and he is discharged out of prison. He goes to his aunt's house where we find out he was in prison for four months. So yeah, those four shots were supposed to portray four months. That's okay, whatever. Okay, so this is like super frustrating. So looking back, I realized that I completely misframed my argument as to why I have an issue with this scene. My issue is not that the film shows Billy stay in prison, which as we later learn was a total of four months, in four shots. I think that a film showing the passage of time in as efficient a way as possible is a good thing. The issue I have is that these four shots do a very, 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 very poor job of communicating passage of time. If we just look at the shots, they like they almost look like as if they take place on the same day or at most may, like maybe over the course of like a few days. Like there's no there's no way to gauge from these shots that he was in jail for like several months. Like again, like it, it kind of looks like almost like the same day. We don't see any sort of difference in Billy's appearance. He doesn't have longer hair, different facial hair, or, or, you know, he's not like more muscular or anything. Had it not been for this line in the next scene, I got picked out like four months ago. Again, I would have thought Billy was in jail for maybe a week at most. And again, since this, this is actually like important because how long he was in jail actually is important because, you know, it, he has to be in jail long enough to kind of convince Costello that, you know, it's not a setup. But yeah, you, you, you know what I mean? So, yeah, my issue here is that the film does a very poor job at communicating the passage of time, both in this scene is like sort of like a microcosm, but, you know, sort of like in general as to how long he's been undercover. And it relies on exposition to communicate it, which is again frustrating because given how Scorsese, how well he has done this in previous films, I like, I see no reason why simply, like why he couldn't have simply utilized, say like some visual cues, like longer hair, different clothing to communicate how long he's been undercover. And again, it wouldn't be a big deal, but because how long Billy has been undercover, you know, and the stress and strain it's put on his life is such a big part of his character, I think this really, really hurts the film in terms of his characterization. Anyway, I then discussed the way in which Billy goes about getting Costello's attention so he can infiltrate his inner circle by way of first doing coke deals with his cousin and later beating up on the Providence mobsters, who I incorrectly stated were Jersey mobsters in my original review. I had uh, too much Sopranos on the brain. That's just a th 
that's just a thing you're gonna have to get used to in retrospect i'm not really sure why <laughs> like it, like again this is one of those things where i'm like i don't know why i was so mad about it like obviously billy needs a way to get costello's attention so he like he sort of has to wing it like, again it's another example of me just reaching too hard to try and find shit to complain about however then i discuss how billy being accepted into costello's crew like basically immediately seems really really odd like everyone else in the crew are like they're hardened gangsters who have most likely been with costello for years if not decades and yet billy gets taken under his wing almost like right away now i discuss my issue with costello's relationship with billy throughout my original video as like sort of like step by step as the plot progresses but for the sake of efficiency i'm just going to discuss it in its entirety right now perhaps my biggest personal gripe with the film the biggest reason i just can't buy into the story at all is the fact that i just cannot believe that costello is unable to see that billy is clearly the mole like not only is he the newest guy in the crew not not only does he he do a lot of suspicious shit not only does billy constantly look like he's having a heart attack but in the very scene where billy first meets with costello costello straight up theorizes that perhaps queenan purposely had billy kicked out of the stadies so he could become a mole which is exactly what queenan did for me it's just really hard to buy that even though the film plays up the fact that costello is supposedly becoming progressively more unhinged he isn't able to see that billy is clearly the mole granted there are times when he suspects him such as during the scene where he confronts him in the restaurant and the subsequent scene when he sets up a trap by feeding billy disinformation but again since the film communicates very explicitly that costello is sort of like he, he's sort of losing his marbles personally it is just something i am unable to buy into conversely in infernal affairs as i said billy's counterpart chan had been a gangster for a decade and is one of sam's who is costello's counterpart most trusted confidants and yet sam is still more suspicious of chan than costello is of billy now i don't mention this until later in my original review but in retrospect i really should have brought this up right away in an early draft of the script for the departed it is established that costello is billy's godfather and with this in mind at least for me the film makes so much more sense in said early draft costello being billy's godfather implies that costello was not just an acquaintance of billy's father their relationship come to think of it isn't really all that clear in the final film but yeah he's not just an acquaintance he, like if he's his godfather he was obviously a very close friend to billy's dad but then at some point he and billy's father must have took separate paths billy's dad going straight and costello pursuing crime the reason this little tidbit i would say is so vital is that it makes both costello making billy part of his inner circle and his inability to finger billy as the mole less of him just seeming kind of dumb and more about sort of an internal struggle that costello was dealing with with this in mind i think you could almost read the film as costello like on some level almost knowing that billy is the mole but he doesn't want to face it since if he does he knows that will of course have to lead to him killing billy which given his implied close relationship with billy's father he could never bring himself to do or at the very least his sentimentality towards billy due to his relationship with his father makes it hard for him to see billy clearly not only does this make the entire dynamic between billy and costello make a hell of a lot more sense but it retroactively makes me dislike the film even more since costello is robbed of a tremendous amount of depth throughout the film we see hints of costello's soft side for billy for example the scene where he brings up the idea of billy going back to school and not pursuing a life of crime but since in the film the nature of costello's relationship with billy's father isn't really fleshed out is it, like, this kind of comes out of nowhere but with costello being billy's godfather it actually makes it seem to some extent that costello sort of you know like he sort of regrets his life choices and perhaps wishes that he had followed billy's father on his path away from crime which in fact is a huge theme of infernal affairs but since the godfather thing is not in the film all this nuance is robbed from costello as a character thus just sort of making him a one-note psycho which admittedly is still entertaining given nicholson chews the ever-loving fuck out of the scenery i then go on to complain about madeline who i also shit on thoroughly throughout the review you know like step by step but again sake of efficiency let me just say i think she is an awful character who adds nothing to the film like not only does the fact that she ends up getting involved with both moles like not like, like not only is that like super contrived she's actually an amalgamation of two different characters in infernal affairs it seems like her only function is to have an affair with billy 
so Colin can get cucked and then be the one who tips off Dignam at the end about Colin being the mole, which as I will discuss a bit later, completely misses the point of the original film. But for now, let me just wrap this up by saying I 100% stand by my stance on Madeline being completely useless and the whole love triangle subplot has a very soap opera-y vibe which does not suit the rest of the film whatsoever. I then go on to discuss how the scene where Queen is killed is completely robbed of its impact due to the existence of Dignum, which I also stand by. In Infernal Affairs, things play out pretty much exactly the same. Chan meets Wong, who is Queen's counterpart, but Sam's crew comes to ambush them. Chan escapes, but Wong is thrown from the roof to his death. Now, in Infernal Affairs, this is the ultimate oh fuck moment. Not only has Chan lost literally the only friend he has had over the last decade, but also, since there is no Dignum counterpart in Infernal Affairs, Wong's death means that literally no one else in the entire world knows that Chan is a cop. Thus, this signifies Chan losing any chance of ever being able to return to his original identity. Whereas in The Departed, not only is the relationship between Billy and Queen in very underdeveloped, like they sort of bait a father-son thing, but it's just, it's just not very fleshed out, but the entire idea of Queen's death signifying Billy never being able to return to his original identity just doesn't make sense because Dignum. Like, yeah, Dignum is put on leave after Queen's death, but he still knows Billy is the mole. So again, this moment is robbed of the impact that it's supposed to have, or at least, or at least presumably. Rewatching my original review, I think part of the reason it wasn't all well received, despite the fact that, again, I, I think I made some pretty strong arguments as to why The Departed not only pales in comparison to Infernal Affairs, but also has a lot of flaws as a film in its own right, is because of that, like, rage bro tone I was using throughout the vid. It may it seem less like I was critiquing the film from an objective standpoint and more like I had a chip on my shoulder about it. Which is why I also felt the need to try and criticize literally everything about it. Like no matter how small of a nitpick it was, I had to like, you know, like, you fuck this shit. Like rewatching the review, it comes off as more of a forced takedown in bad faith which is why I really didn't like the review and I don't consider it emblematic of what I want the channel to be. However, I will admit that, despite my more measured tone in this video, I do in fact have a chip on my shoulder about The Departed, due to the fact that it seemed like writer William Monaghan took so much from Infernal Affairs, but didn't understand what he was adapting. He borrowed so much from the film, which is fine. Like I'm not like I'm not like saying it's a ripoff. It's credited as a remake. But the changes he made actually stripped the film's thematic beats of their power. I don't know if Monaghan realized that his addition of Dignum completely robs the scene of the impact it had in Infernal Affairs. Another example of the film completely missing the point of its source material is what I discuss next in my original review, Colin's betrayal of Costello. In The Departed. After Colin learns that Costello was an FBI informant, he worked with Billy to set him up and ultimately kills him. Whereas in Infernal Affairs, there is nothing about Sam being an informant. Colin's counterpart Lau, feeling guilt about Wong's death, decides to betray Sam so he can put an end to his criminal life. This is another huge moment that The Departed didn't seem to understand or at least decided to forgo. In Infernal Affairs, Lau is a far more fleshed out character than Colin. He feels a tremendous amount of turmoil over his status as a mole, and it is Wong's death that finally makes him decide to turn over a new leaf. His killing of Sam is done to facilitate his clean slate. He no longer has to be a mole, and from now on can control the direction his life will take. Whereas in The Departed, the only reason Colin ends up betraying Costello is because he fears he might be given up to the FBI. It is done solely out of self-preservation, whereas Lau's decision signifies a shift in his character. With this being the principal example, I have to say another area where I think The Departed just fails on its own is Colin's characterization. Like, he's just like such a fucking bitch throughout the whole movie. And I like I get like he's supposed to be like the villain, but like we, we never really get a sense as to why he continues to work for Costello since he is a colossal dick to him throughout the whole movie. And this also makes his implied father son dynamic between them fall flat since I, I don't think Costello like he did. I don't think he says like a single nice thing to Colin throughout the whole movie and his decision to betray Costello is one made out of fear as opposed to any sort of personal agency or desire to become a better person. Again, maybe that was the point, but I just don't find that interesting all that much, especially compared to Lau in Infernal Affairs. Anyway, after Costello was killed, Billy is able to return to his old life, and it seems that Colin is going to walk free. But after Billy finds an envelope he had written on earlier, he realizes Colin is the mole. 
Everything plays out exactly the same in Infernal Affairs. However, once again, we see The Departed not really understanding the point of certain scenes that it adapted from the original film. In The Departed, after Billy finds out that Colin is the mole, he flees the police station. It then cuts to presumably, like maybe a few days or like a week later, and Billy calls Colin, telling him that Costello recorded all of his conversations with Colin and that Costello's lawyer gave them all to Billy. The issue here is that because of this, this makes the entire envelope thing completely pointless. If Billy never found the envelope, he still would have discovered that Colin was the mole later, after he received the tapes from Costello's lawyer. So the whole envelope thing in The Departed is completely redundant and doesn't, it, there's no causal link between that and him receiving the tapes from Frank's lawyer. However, in Infernal Affairs, earlier in the film, Chan sees that Sam has a bunch of tapes in his desk, though he is not sure what exactly they are. But after finding the envelope, Chan puts two and two together and wonders if perhaps the tapes implicate Lao as the mole. So then Chan goes to retrieve the tapes, discovers Lao's voice on said tapes, and that is when he contacts Lao. So in Infernal Affairs, Chan needs to find the envelope, because if he doesn't, then he never goes and retrieves the tapes. But in The Departed, Billy does not need to find the envelope, because Costello's lawyer would have given him the tapes at some point regardless. This might seem like a nitpick, and maybe it is because it does all end up in the same place anyway, but it's just very, very frustrating when it seems like, once again, Monaghan adapted plot points from Infernal Affairs without really understanding why certain events happen and their causal relationship between one another. Now, in my original review, I go into detail how the entire final act of The Departed is utter nonsense, which it is. But to be fair, this is because the entire final act of Infernal Affairs is also utter nonsense. So let me ask you a question. You have been hunting a mole for literal years. It has caused you an immense amount of stress and turmoil, and suddenly you are given a bountiful amount of evidence proving that this person is in fact a mole. So, what do you do? Do you A, immediately take said evidence to the police station so the mole will be outed as the traitor and will be arrested, or B, D don't do that and inst instead tell the mole to meet you on the top of a building without bringing any of said like you know evidence even though doing so clearly puts yourself at risk of the mole or someone else getting the upper hand on you like i i, I don't want to be too negative but like it's so fucking stupid however believe it or not i actually have to give the departed credit here because at least in the departed billy gives madeline an envelope to open in the case of his death so he clearly knew that something could go wrong by meeting Colin on the rooftop. But this is still frustrating because, what, like, why did Billy want to meet him on the rooftop at all? Like, he had already been to the police station. Other people knew that he was a cop. So it, meeting Colin on the roof in, with none of the evidence... Also, also, by the, at the end of the movie, all the evidence that Billy supposedly had just disappears. Um, there's this shit he sent Madeline, but, like, isn't there, like, a huge box of tapes just sitting in his, his house that, like, they're going to find later? I don't know. Whatever. However, in Infernal Affairs, Chan calls the cops ahead of time to meet him at the building. But also, Chan doesn't tell the cops the identity of the mole when he calls them, which is also stupid. Like, like imagine that. Like, hey, hey guys, come and uh, arrest the mole. I have him at the building. And they're like, oh, you have the mole. Who is he? And they're like, I don't you have to like wait it's gonna be a surprise and then in both films another character reveals themselves as another mole kills billy slash chan and is then killed by colin slash lao thus colin slash lao implicates them as the police mole and thus they are able to clear their names so this is a very big sin committed by both films the existence of the second mole doesn't make any sense because like how would the second mole know the identity of the first mole but not vice versa like maybe he was sent by the boss to keep an eye on him I don't know. It seems, again, the, the entire finale is very, very, very contrived in both films. But then comes the ending in which we see, once again, The Departed missing the entire point of the ending of Infernal Affairs. So in The Departed, Colin is seemingly going to walk free. But, of course, Billy gave Madeline an envelope, which I presume held evidence of Colin being the mole, as well as instructions to inform Dignam, which she does, which leads to Dignam killing Colin. Now, on one hand, seeing as Colin is far less of a fleshed out and empathetic character compared to Lau, I guess him getting domed is a satisfying payoff. However, it's very hard to ignore just how better the ending of Infernal Affairs is, as well as how much The Departed misses its entire point. In Infernal Affairs,
characters, there is no Madeline and there is no Dignum. So in the end, Lau gets away scot-free, which you know, like on, on the surface sounds like a crappy ending, but it is anything but. As I discuss in my original review, in The Departed, I would say Billy is the protagonist while Colin is the antagonist, but in Infernal Affairs, Chan is the antagonist and Lau is the protagonist. Lau is the one who undergoes the character change. He begins the film as a mole working against the police, eventually begins to reconsider the morality of his actions, is plagued with guilt after his actions result in the death of a fellow officer, makes a decision to turn a new leaf and start anew, but ultimately is denied the chance. In the end, despite walking free, he must live with the death of a good man on his conscience, a man whose life he wishes he could have had. Despite its very evident flaws, I consider Infernal Affairs to be exceedingly superior to The Departed for Lau's characterization and arc in particular. The death of Colin in The Departed, while satisfying, I guess, since he is a piece of shit throughout the movie, is rather fleeting. Since we never really empathize with him, and yeah, he's just sort of a villain, so... But like, not even an opposing or interesting villain, like more, more just like a, like a wimpy little bitch villain. As I note in my original review, I also do find it ironic that in the mainland China release of Infernal Affairs, China made them shoot an alternate ending where Lao is arrested and is punished for his crimes because, you know, China, and how this is sort of the same ending that The Departed goes with, in which Colin, instead of getting the life he always wanted, but feeling guilt and shame about it, he just gets killed. So anyway, that's all I got. I know I didn't use a lot of footage from my original review as this video went on, but that's mostly because, well, one, the audio made me want to jam a knife through my ear. But also, like I said, I really do think I had some solid points. It was just the delivery that was so obnoxious. I really came off as if I was trying so hard to attack the film that it made me come off as bad faith and sort of casted a rain cloud over the entire video. Oh, shit, I almost forgot. I, I also mentioned in my original review something about a supposed offensive homosexual subplot that I realized I, I completely didn't mention in the rest of the review. So what I was going to talk about is how in the film it is implied Colin is unable to perform sexually with Madeline. Now on one hand you could say this is simply due to the stress of living a double life. However, given several moments in the film, such as when Colin is insulting the firefighters towards the beginning of the film with a bunch of homophobic slurs or a handful of comments made in passing by Costello, I remember reading some theories at the time that Colin, like it's trying to imply that Colin might be secretly gay. But in retrospect, I think this was sort of a stretch. Ironically, I was thinking it was a case of the armored closet gay trope that I discussed in my previous video on the film Cruising. I think it's just more likely that Colin isn't able to perform due to stress, and it's really only in the film to make sure the audience knows that when Madeline gets knocked up, it's Billy's and not Colin. But yeah, all in all, I stand by my original opinion that the film is not good and is mostly just praised due to its director and cast. But hopefully this vid is less of a pain in the ass to get through and communicates the gripes I have with the film in a somewhat less bitchy and condescending manner. I think the biggest reason I dislike my original review is that, while I do shit on stuff from time to time just for fun on the channel, when it comes to my more serious critiques, I try and find the positive in the negative. And in retrospect, I didn't really go into that with my original review and was just focused on hating the film. I realized that what I think we should take away from the flaws of The Departed is that when adapting a piece of media, it is crucial to fully understand what you are adapting to fully understand why certain choices were made. Why it was so important that Chan was such a seasoned criminal veteran, since Billy not being so makes the fact that Costello doesn't know he's the mole kind of hard to believe. Why the death of Wong was so impactful on Chan from a character perspective, while in The Departed the insertion of Digman into the film robs Queen's death of a large portion of its impact. Why Lau having a change of heart, which in turn results in his betrayal of Sam was so integral to his arc, whereas in The Departed, Colin's betrayal of Costello is not brought up about by any sort of character shift, but rather just self-preservation. Why something as small as the envelope scene is crucial in one story and pointless in another. And finally, what the entire point of the story is. Infernal Affairs, while absolutely flawed, really does have something to say in Lao's arc of a man who saw the error of his ways but was still condemned to a life of shame and guilt, I find tragically brilliant. Whereas in The Departed, it was a fun ride maybe the first time, but I'm 
I'm not really sure it, what, if anything, it is trying to say. And in retrospect, from a story perspective, I just find the film incredibly hollow. So yeah, hopefully you got something out of this Redux as I did, and hopefully I will never come off as this much of an insufferable twat ever again. But don't get your hopes up, bitches. Bitches.